welcome to the inaugural episode of Sweet Sweet Fantasy, the podcast where we discuss the Mariah Carey song Sweet Sweet Fantasy over and over again. That's not true. And what, what do we actually do? We talk about fantasy novels, meaning books with elves and shit, <laughs> um, and other things, maybe. That's right. It's a fantasy book club podcast, so you guys can know what book we're going to talk about. We're going to tell you a month in advance. You can read it. And then we can all talk about it together. So for this first one, we did The Dragon Bone Chair by Tad Williams. How'd you find this book? Because you suggested it and said it was super addictive. So then I had to read it. So the way I found it was that I read um, Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And you know how they always have those like, you know, BS kind of uh, critiques of the book. And one of them was like, oh, well, this reminded me a lot of Tad Williams. And I didn't know who that was. So I decided I'd check it out, and sure enough, that's how I landed on it. That's cool. Um, Hopefully this podcast will be a good way for people to find new and good fantasy books. We might talk about bad books, too. Maybe. I have a hard time finishing bad books, but if you think it's like worth it journalistically, we could also talk about some bad books and why they're bad. That could be fun, too. I don't know. So this was not a bad book, you think? (laughs) It was not. I would say it's like a good to great book. Mm. No, it's great. It's great. I agree. I liked it. I thought almost, to me, it was almost as if there was a high school assignment where you just had to write a fantasy book with all the standard tropes. It's like, all right, we need elves. We need dragons. We need, you know, swords with magical powers. Just make sure you use everything like that. And, you know, and... That basically was what it was. Like, I didn't think it was too original or anything, but for some reason, I just thought it was really, really good. The quality and the execution somehow really just worked for me. I should say, before we get really into talking about the book, we're going to be talking about it as two people who have read it. So if if you don't want to know anything about the story before you read the book, um, I wouldn't listen to the rest of the podcast. But as far as, like spoilers go I was thinking about this and there's like nothing to spoil in the book really (laughs) like it's it's a it's a quest book and if I tell you like trouble's gonna happen to like our poor kitchen boy like that's not really a spoiler so I wouldn't worry too much about listening to this discussion true but But that being said from now on read the book (laughs) read the book first when you have a chance (laughs) Um, But yeah, as far as it's, like you said, kind of formulaic um, or like traditional, I was thinking about like, why did it work so well when there wasn't really any suspense? Like, you know, the hapless kitchen boy is going to turn into a hero at some point. Right. He's probably going to be king of the realm at some point. You know, there's a like, there's a bad guy, like something bad's going to happen. There wasn't like a lot of suspense in the book, but I still like was flipping the pages pretty fast. Yeah, I agree. I don't know what that is. I think part of it has to do with the fact that uh, Mr. Williams seems to be a really good writer, I thought. Even his prose sometimes. I mean, he used a lot of metaphors. I remember there was one time that he used three like metaphors in the same paragraph. Like He was like, the clouds were like, an ominous grandfather looking down and the bushes were like like literally just three in a row but some of those i thought were really cool and i think that might have kind of pushed it along for me at least to like set the scene i think his writing got more like that like it got more epic in tone as the book progressed like in the first third of the book it's pretty slow and it's pretty much like setting up the day-to-day of the castle where everybody lives um and introducing the characters and they don't really start working towards anything until like a third of the way through the book I would say um but then I felt like his writing style got way more epic and you're just like oh shit something's about to happen now um Mm -hmm. so like that was a cool way it moved it along yeah and I also think that was one of the reasons I liked it as well is that it had this real slow burn quality when you were still in the castle, when you got to page like about 150 or so, you kind of felt this huge story coming on. And obviously, of course, they leave the castle and they explore the rest of the world. But I really love that feeling. I don't know if I think there's a better feeling in all of entertainment when you know that you're reading a book that you truly like 
and you're like, wow, I have 500 pages left. Yes. <laughs> that's a good point. And that's kind of one thing I really like about fantasy in particular is like their books are really long. Mm-hmm. Like they're all really long and oftentimes part of a trilogy. So you've got thousands of pages of this material that you really like. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the characters? Did you have a favorite character? Um, I liked a lot of characters for different reasons. And that was another thing that I thought was cool about this book. Because usually I kind of will end up like skimming through a certain person's chapters when it's broken up like this into like different people's you know side quests and their little adventures and I almost always find myself like I don't care what happens to that person and flip through their chapter but in this book I liked everybody for different reasons except for Simon yeah (laughs) I really really and he's he's the main character of the book well main character pretty much yeah he's the he's the main character of the book but there's a lot of significant characters but you know what it is, though? I always feel like with the main character, you can't have him be, like, too cool because he needs to have this inner strife thing happening. Like Harry Potter, for example, right? They're like, yo, wizard Harry. And Harry's like, no, I don't want to be a wizard. Like, obviously, where <laughs> yeah. every person in the world would be like, I'm a wizard? Sweet. Sounds great, you know? And, like, yeah, Simon, he's always whining about this and that. I mean, he did go through a lot, though, you know? He was always tired, always kind of ragged. And, uh... I don't know. I like the fact that he was kind of like lazy, but he was also able to get things done from time to time. <laughs> from time to time. I, I feel like the author went out of his way to like really make him seem unlikable and incapable. And I'm wondering if that was a deliberate choice or if it's just things that really like specifically resonated with me. Like when he shirks his chores and then somebody else has to do them for him, like the tired old woman who's like raised him and worked like 16 hours a day for her entire life in the castle. Mm -hmm. So like those things just really ticked me off. And it's like, but I think it was intentional because you see that Simon is really short-sighted. He's really selfish. Like he doesn't even think about how his actions are affecting people around him. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't, yeah, he just, and he, he's always like, oh, why is this happening to me? Mm-hmm. Like, and then you, as the book progresses, you see, like, he actually has a pretty good life in comparison with people who, even though he's, like, a servant in the castle, he has a way better life than people living on the farm or the peasants or, like, there's food shortages. So, like, he's kind of, like, he's a priss. There's so many negative things I could say about him. You're right. There's almost nothing good about him. Yeah. There's, like, almost... The two things that are cool about him are the fact that the wolf likes him, which is probably just by default because he's hanging out with him. But I mean that (laughs) and the fact that for some reason he was able to wield the magical sword. It almost just doesn't make any sense. Like, all right, here's this kid that always like, you know, kind of bitches and whines the entire time. And when it comes time to see who's going to wield the magical sword, it happens to be him. Do you have any theories on that? It's his lineage. He has to be the bastard son of like Prester John or something. It Yeah. His father is a mystery to him so probably his father is gonna end up being somebody famous but I also hate those that there's an element of aristocracy in a lot of fantasy novels like can't just anybody like can't we just have merit-based ascension <laughs> but like may- maybe that'll be the case but I it maybe does it feel like they're setting it up to be he's of some famous lineage but I yeah so, so Doctor, the Doctor Morgens. That's uh-huh. how I said it the whole time I was reading. Me too. Um, okay, so like Doctor Morgens takes the shine to him, and now that you mention, now that you're saying this, I'm thinking maybe he knew who Simon's father was. I think that's absolutely true because when you think of the fact that, um, remember when Simon was born, and he's like, Rachel, we have to keep the kid alive as opposed to the mom because they have that debate they're like who are we going to keep alive that's true and they focus on the kid because i think dr morgan's knows that he's like somebody important secretly okay and that's why that's why there's so much like you know there's so much around and there's so many resources being put in him dr morgan's you know basically hires binabic to be his kind of you know caretaker if anything should happen to the doctor so yeah i think that's basically what they're kind of uh setting us up for what did you think of i also heard vaguely and this might not be true but i heard that uh george r R. martin took a lot from the book 
Oh, yeah. and actually, before I go on, I was going to say that, too, because even though right now it feels like really traditional and kind of like unoriginal, maybe when it first came out, it was mm-hmm. a lot more interesting because, I mean, look, it is very much like Lord of the Rings, I guess, but really, like, isn't all of fantasy just basically like some kind of like, you know, villagey, um, provincial character kind of needs to go off into the wide world and they're chosen for some reason and there's some type of magical weapon they're wielding for some reason and there's also a force of darkness descending over the land that hasn't been there until recently. Isn't that basically <laughs> like everything? Yeah, that's like, you know that book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by no. Joseph Campbell where he talks about archetypes in art and literature? Mm. There's like there's a single quest story. So, yeah, I think to a certain extent... It's unfair to say it's unoriginal because it's just like... It's just what the story is. Yeah, it's the Iliad, you know, just I, over and over again. I do remember that Joseph Campbell thing now that you mentioned it. I remember him saying that the reason that quest story keeps popping up is because it's part of your fiber as a human. Yeah. And what's interesting is, is if you don't live out that quest like for yourself, you're going to dream about living out the quest forever. So basically his theory is that like every human has it in themselves to break away from home, explore the big wide world, have trials and tribulations, have, you know, pleasurable moments. And then you just realize that like, ah, home's like not that bad. (laughs) Yeah. I actually read some of that book, um, like in, to see if I could get more context on the books that we're going to be talking about. And I recommend it to a certain extent. It's very skewed towards males going out and having a quest and he even includes some stuff about how you know freud stipulates that women don't have the same drive for adventure because they're not searching for love Uh and like men men need to search for love since they leave their mother's wombs um so (laughs) clearly he hasn't experienced the me too movement yet (laughs) no he is not (laughs) um and like neither has tad williams Uh uh-huh but i actually felt like it's not as bad as some fantasy stories for like including female characters yes there's some cool characters the princess was cool yeah so when you we meet the princess she's very brave she's very competent um and it's i think it's like sort of funny that you couldn't introduce a female character that was as awful as simon because people would just like hate her (laughs) so badly (laughs) <laughs> but it's like, okay, we have this teenage girl. It's the same age as the boy, but she's going to be better in every way. Um, mm-hmm. Well, that's another thing actually I want to talk about is how the it's always awkward to handle like the teenage romance in novels like this, just mm-hmm. because I guess it must be like Simon's character. But once again, I think it's because they just need the story to move along. Because if Simon was kind of just like a well-adjusted you know, teenage dude, he wouldn't have any kind of anxiety towards Miramel at all because she never gave him any reason to think that, like, she liked him or didn't like him or whatever. But in Simon's head, she was like, oh, my God, she hates me. And now that she's the princess, oh, no. He, like, runs crying out of the room, remember, during the meeting? Yeah, he's insecure on top of everything else that's wrong with him. He's extremely (laughs) insecure. Yeah, I mean, why, that's that's once again, it's like, if you were in real life, wouldn't you be like, yes, I got to hang out with the princess for like three weeks? Like, <laughs> I think you would, but I imagine there's other people who wouldn't feel that way. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think also, like, the thing that kept the story moving along in terms of that character development, it's like, you do have to have people grow. And when the plot changes, but the characters don't grow at all, it's still a really boring book, like, by the end. Oh, so you think that he's planning to make Simon, like, into a true badass as the series goes on? Yeah. I mean, he has to. And you see, like, very small inklings of it happening. But I just didn't want, like, it's just so, it's so much in the beginning of the book. Like, he's not just clueless as to the world. Like, in other stories, people will get thrown into an environment and, like, they're not inherently incompetent people, but they're just clueless as to the world around them whereas like simon's character is really just driven like it's assassinated by the author for like the first half of the book and then he backs off a little bit as simon like gets out and starts experiencing new things but like he then he gets hurt all the time and he's always passing out and then having to be rescued 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's just like, um, yeah, he's like a very weak character, but he's not annoying. I wasn't like, I don't want to spend any more time with Simon. It was more just like, I can't believe this kid. Like, why are they even taking him along on this trip at all? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. And I guess it's because the doctor told Binnebeck that he was important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what did you think of the wolf? I like the wolf. I thought the wolf was cool. The wolf was a very cool addition. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty common to fancy to have, like, some cool animal character. But I feel like they did her, like, I was, like, warm to my heart when, like, I don't know, it would just be like, oh, the wolf settled down next to Simon. You know, yeah. I'd just be like, yeah. That know? would make me feel really good, too. Yeah. Yeah, the wolf was really cool. Um, there's trolls in the book. The troll, the troll was really cool. The troll was really cool. That, like that was a cool coolest. take on trolls, too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and then having... I liked how there was, like, a little bit of... Like, the Sithy in the book are obviously elves. Yeah. Like, well, is that We'll how have you, to call them elves, yeah. That's how you, like, imagine them, Yeah, they're them, immortal. Right? They just move great more gracefully than the mortals, and they have all this knowledge. Yeah. They're be- yeah, they're beautiful, immortal. So, like, they're elves. Pretty much. Um, but I think the author used that, that, like, creative language sparingly enough that it wasn't too hard to pay attention to. Like, some books you're reading it and you're like, wait, what is that again? Oh. There's, like, a t- ton of vocabulary you have to remember. That's um, true. And, like, that's engaging up to a point and immersive. And then when it crosses that point, it's just it's really distracting because there's like too many new terms for things. Yes. And I liked in this book how like the Sithi may as well be elves, but they're not. And then there's like, he has different names for the days of the week. Um, There's a different Christian God or not Christian because the Adonites is what they call their religion. Mm -hmm. So there's like, but it was basically Christianity. I mean, they talked about getting nailed to the cross and blah, blah, blah. Or not the cross, but it's something like that. A tree, a tree. They make the sign of the tree. So there's like, I think that was maybe a good way to do that where it's, just terminology that's um, um, uh-huh. enough to something that you already know so that it's easy to remember and you're not spending the whole book like looking at the glossary definitely and i thought another um two things that i liked about it now that we're talking about this theme and some of the kind of pitfalls i think some fantasy falls into one thing was there wasn't too much talk about what people were wearing and eating I, I like love that. that. I love that. <laughs> You're right, because most fans, you know, he wore a no, velvet brooch. No, 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 brooch. I like the wearing oh, and eating. Oh, you like the wearing was, and eating. Yes, I want to know what clothes they're in, oh. so I can tell, like, roughly. See, I tune out. <laughs> you know, no, they, they had, you know, they had brambleberry wine and, uh, you know, uh, b- b- you know. Oh, my God, I <laughs> Bilberry love, cakes I and, you know. That. Specifically the eating the eating and the wearing. I want those details. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah, but I felt like there was Well, enough. that's fair. There were enough. Yeah, yeah. And another thing also is that since fantasy is dealing with all these um, kind of like esoteric and almost ambiguous kind of like powers, I think that can also be convoluted a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in this book, we know they talk about the original dragon that's kind of like eating itself and encircles all the world and the Sith is telling him about the way things are eternally and stuff. There wasn't really too much of that. It dealt a lot in like brass tacks and like um, action, which I really appreciated. Mm-hmm. I really also did think that the action was really well done. Like the fight yeah. sequences and stuff was just pretty much as good as it could be. Like I thought I was like, wow, that was really good. Super vibrant in your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for fantasy, world building is a huge part of it. Um, and for this book, it kind of it kind of felt like there wasn't that character that needs everything needs to be explained to them. I mean, Simon kind of is that character, but it wasn't like he was kind of he seemed like he knew the audience was basically on board. Like he doesn't explain where the magic comes from or like why there's magic in the world. Because mm-hmm. it's just like, you guys picked up this book, you accept the existence of magic, like, let's go. Mm-hmm. And then the stuff about the different lore for the different cultures, like, it wasn't just purely expository, it was also, like, used in the characterization of different people. So, like, all of his exposition, I think, was 
just woven into the story really well. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to like, yeah, listen to one person just tell the story of Usiri's Adon. You just would like hear little snippets of it and then gradually you understood what they were talking about. You're right. Yeah, he did do that well. Yeah, and that was, and like the reason that I like the details about the clothes and the food, it's because like, well, I also love like the historical clothing of different time periods. So if they, if like, and I'm sure this isn't the case for you. So if they're like describing a woman with like a high necked dress, I know it's going to be like analogous to a later period in history than if she's wearing like a corset, which would be more like 1700s. Mm -hmm. So like, that's one thing that I'm thinking like, okay, what time period are they basing this off of? Oh. But this, it was clear in other ways, like, there it's a, there's a castle immediately you're just like okay this is medieval times yeah and along with what you were saying about kind of just twisting the names of months and weeks and things really it did have a very good kind of melding of almost real world and fantasy which is something that you're looking for i think in a fantasy novel like you want to even though we're dealing with um you know things that obviously wouldn't happen in the real world you want it to feel real and you want beings to kind of act as if they would act in the real world because that's what's mm -hmm. going to draw you in i think like it can't be completely too i don't know wishy-washy and have nothing to do with the way that you perceive that beings should act you know what i mean yeah i think you have to make it really clear at the beginning of the book like you have to set the reader's expectations and then make sure that you fulfill them throughout the story so if the closer that you set your story to real life or a real time period the easier it is to like fulfill people's expectations whereas if you create this entirely new universe with different values then it's gonna be really hard to stay consistent through the whole thing like i just and i think like game of thrones is one of those books where i feel like just as an example, he like tried to subvert too many fantasy tropes and then ended up in a place where it's like nobody's satisfied and like nothing is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, well, he was on a roll for the first three books, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we digress. But like <laughs> in, the, in that sense, I think it's really important for fantasy readers to like have the world explained to them and spread out and like the rules explained. Uh huh. And if you do that in a way that's more similar to real life. It's like easier to explain that. Mm -hmm. Cause if you already know like, okay, king, castle, knights, you accept a sense of honor and duty that people have. So it's like a little bit easier to think, to like swallow when people are taking on this totally hopeless quest, basically. Oh. You think like, all right, that, that sense of duty and the greater good is important to these people. Yeah, they did just they just went off on the quest right after they read that passage. They're like, yeah. oh, like here's this like respected poet, I guess, and he talks about three swords, so let's find the swords, you know? That yeah. was kind of like, you know. I mean, what else are they going to do? Like just sit in the smoldering castle until yeah, yeah. they like, get killed? But What did you think about the dream road? Because to me personally, it felt almost like it was a reference to psychedelics in a way. Yeah, Because it was definitely. like, we can kind of like, we can go into this dreamland and maybe we can take some cool stuff out of it that we wouldn't normally understand, but things might go like sideways as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed like they were all like, they drank some tea, right? Mm -hmm. Right before it? Yeah, it seemed like maybe it was a mushroom trip reference. Yeah, or something like that. Like it reminds me of when people talk about like taking like hard psychedelics like DMT or something and they're like, oh, you might run into some like alien forces or something that might mess with you. you know? Yeah. I felt like maybe that's what he was like kind of like getting at with that. But that was interesting. Because in my mind, I was like, just go on to the dream road again. Like, we need answers. Like, let's go. Yeah, I think when you introduce something like that, you're like, why did you only go the one time? Well, because they said it's so dangerous and stuff. Oh, yeah, I remember uh -huh. they brought it up for it to go again. But Binnebic was like, I don't think it's a good idea. And that's all that was said about it. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, you, you always, there's always that, like, that person who knows everything that shows up in books like this. And in this book, it was kind of like Morgan's then Binnebeck a little bit mm -hmm. and like Galloway seems like she knows everything mm -hmm. um so you always have to have some kind of like almost like divine intervention into the story to like point the people in the right direction 
Yeah. Like, you know, in Lord of the Rings, they have to, like, go see Elrond first to, like, know what the ring is. And then he basically tells them what they have to do. That was and... one thing that was really cool, I thought, how the evil villain isn't some dark, mysterious kind of sauron force. It's actually an elf. Mm-hmm. Who's or a Sithy in this case? Yeah. Who like kind of like diverted off the path or whatever? He's a Norn. He's a Norn. The Sithies are good. Right, but they're basically the same like yeah. species, right? And yeah, they kind yeah. of divided two ways. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and it's cool how he kind of like looms over the story, where you don't see him oh, at you all. Never like, see him. Like he doesn't come to the meeting where. They oh were, right. You know, like it's all he's very much like a shadow in the story and you know we're gonna meet him at some point so that's kind of cool to like look forward to that yeah there's a lot of characters that are looming like whatever that white queen is that um oh, yeah. simon keeps seeing yeah yeah uh-huh. and you know what i'm really interested in too is this is kind of a tangent but um since we're not going to be featuring the second book i'm wondering why the troll king has imprisoned benedict like what could that possibly did you read any of the second book yeah I'm so almost... do you know the answer yeah what is the answer um, Benebeck was betrothed to his daughter. Oh, so it's something that has nothing to do with like anything Benebeck did. Well, kind of, because he left because he got the words he left the Troll King's daughter because he got the message from Morgens that he had to go and protect Simon. I see. So like the quest brought him away. Um and then when they come back but I feel like he could have maybe explained to the rest of the tribe why he had to go. Right. <laughs> he just left. Well, that's another thing that happens in books too, right? Like they just don't communicate. You're like, why don't you just tell them? Yeah. You know. I was thinking about that. It is not. It's a thousand percent not in my nature to like, not say something for the sake of my own pride or so. And like that's happens so often. That's another way that you keep the story moving. I think. Yeah. Because if the person was forthright and honest, that there wouldn't be a misunderstanding. So yeah. then there wouldn't be like the sitcom situation that arises. You know. Where, like, one person feels slighted, but, of course, if you took him over and just had a one-on-one, you'd be like, you know, express your feelings, like, then everything yeah. would be, like, okay, you know? I kind of hate, I, I kind of hate that, just because I'm always, like, shouting at my TV, like, just tell them how you feel. It's, <laughs> it's almost the mark of, like, a really good story to ones that aren't so good is to not have so many of those illogical inconsistencies. Yeah. You know? Definitely. Like, the better the story is, the more just kind of tight all around it's going to be. Yeah. And this one, to be fair, it didn't have too many of those. No, not for anything that was important. Which, which might be one of the reasons why we perceive it as being of such high quality. It does seem like it's it was crafted, like, start to finish. He knew what was going to happen. It doesn't feel like he just... he. Do, it doesn't feel like plot points get dropped off or, like, priorities are changing. Like it, Which it, is always amazing to me. Books. I'm just like, how do you do that as an author? Like, how do you have so much... I guess, confidence that it's going to work out. Because that's a lot of time, right? It's a 700-page yeah. book. Like, what, like, you're bartending on the side? Or what are you doing? Like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's, like, pretty amazing. Um, I was reading a book by Orson Scott Card about writing. And he said he usually sits with the story for a year before he starts putting pen to paper or oh. starts typing. So he's, like, brainstorming about it for, like, a year before he starts actually writing the book. That's interesting. And it makes sense, too. Yeah, that takes a lot of patience. Um, Yeah, well, it looks like we're almost coming to the end of this inaugural episode. Um, Wow. I thought it was pretty fun. (laughs) It was fun. We should talk about what we're going to do from here on out. So for this first episode, I don't think we're going to give people a month um, to read the book. We'll probably give like two weeks or something. But from here on out, we're going to do it monthly. And... The next book that we're going to be doing is the first two books, actually, of the Witcher series. Yeah, that is going to be turned into a series on Netflix, I think, coming out in October. So we can all be really cool and know the books before the TV show comes out. The books were better. (laughs) That's what we'll most likely be saying. Fully ready to argue that. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, so whenever we air this episode... um, A month later, we'll do the first two Witcher novels. And we're only doing, we're doing two because it's not that dense, right? It's like 300 pages with huge type. Yeah, exactly. And I think like certain series, there's just not enough to discuss if you only read. 
the first book. Like in Dragonbone Chair, I thought it was a complete story, and you have like a little mini climax at the end of the first book. You learn a lot. There's a lot to take in, a lot to discuss. I don't think that's the case for like every fantasy series. Mm-hmm. Um, but The Witcher one and two, that gives you enough to like really understand what's going on. That's a much more like complicated story, I think. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, we'll Here see we you are. next month. Signing off. <laughs>